With the news, I'm Avanash Ramzan. Good evening and thank you very much for joining us. We start off by telling you that in a case management conference on Thursday, the Caribbean Court of Justice, the CCJ, noted its intention to hear the appeal filed by the Opposition People's Progressive Party challenging the jurisdiction of the Court of Appeal to hear the motion filed by private citizen Eslyn David. The Court of Appeal had ruled that in determining the results of the elections, the country's Chief Elections Officer Keith Lowenfield must do so based on who received the most valid votes. The applicants, opposition leader Barrett Jagdio and PBP's presidential candidate Irfan Ali, and all respondents in the matter, which include the incumbent APNU AFC coalition and the chairman of the Ghana Elections Commission, Justice Retired Claudette Singh, have been given timelines for the submission of all written submissions. The CCJ, headed by President Justice Adrian Saunders, will hear oral submissions on Wednesday, July 1, commencing at 9 hours. The CCJ has not decided whether it has jurisdiction but will do so after all submissions are received. President Saunders told both the applicant and respondents that the CCJ will be looking to rule on whether Guyana's Court of Appeal had jurisdiction to entertain the motion filed by David. Also, the CCJ has been asked to consider if the Court of Appeal lacked such jurisdiction with it, what is the consequences of that through the CCJ and also if the Court of Appeal had rightfully assumed jurisdiction, then also what are the consequences? The CCJ has also been asked to look into whether the Court of Appeal has exceeded its jurisdiction in its ruling. The, court, uh, the CCJ said nothing should be done to prejudice the issues before the court and that a status quo remains. Jagu and Ali took the case to the CCJ over fears that the Chief Elections Officer Keith Lowenfield would use the figures he alone, in agreement with APNU AFC, calculated after calling into question tens of thousands of votes. Those fears were realized last Tuesday when Lowenfield submitted a new report in which he dumped over 115,000 votes and gave APNU AFC majority of the votes to form a new government, even though the certified and valid votes from the recount showed that the PVP won the elections by 15,416 votes. Meanwhile, the People's Progressive Party Civic, through its lawyers, have asked the chairman of the Ghana Elections Commission, Justice Retired Claudette Singh, to instruct the chief elections officer to withdraw the contentious elections report to, uh, he submitted in which he invalidated over 115,000 votes. The letter from attorneys Anil Nandlal and Devendra Kisun is dated June 24 and was part of the submissions to the CCJ on Thursday. The lawyers noted that the CEO did not comply with the request made by the GCOM chairman to submit the results from the recount to declare the winner of the March 2020 elections. When in news returns, the chairman of CARICOM, Mia Motley, describes Ghana's ongoing elections issues as bizarre and international pressure mounts on President David Granger to concede defeat. The chairperson of the Caribbean community, CARICOM, and Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, has described Ghana's 2020 elections as bizarre. During an interview Wednesday night with Trinidad and Tobago's CNC3 News, hours after making a public statement condemning the Ghana's chief elections officer, Keith Lowenfield, for invalidating over 115,000 votes, Motley said CARICOM will observe what will happen in the next few days. We sent in two observer teams. Our observer team was satisfied that the recount process was certified by the persons from the Guyana Election Commission and stood as a credible basis for the declaration of an electoral result. What is going on is a little bizarre to say the least, but we shall wait and see and let the process play out over the next few days. But suffice it to say that there's a charter of civil society within Caribbean community that causes us to have to aspire to a very high level of, of behavior with respect to free and fair elections and with respect to giving full effect to the will of the people. I pray, I pray that we will recognize that there is no election that is worth the life of a single human being, yeah. that there is no election that is worth the damaging of the reputation, not only of one country, but our community, because the Caribbean has been one of those few regions that has seen people move from poverty, absolute abject poverty, in the 1930s, where we had riots across almost every country, to the point where we were well on our way to meeting many of the world millennial development, the sustainable development goals, sorry, going forward. Obviously, we've had some difficulties, but the reason why we've made such progress is because we've given great stop 
to caring about people and building for people? Do we have the capacity that we would like to bring everybody on the train out of poverty? We haven't had it, but we want to continue to do it because it is only through that way that we will move the region from a people that have literally come here in bondage to a people that fully and truly enjoy freedom. Because at the end of the day, as Amartya Sen would say, freedom is choice. Yeah. And if our people don't have the choice as to where to work and how to move and how to do and what to do, then they're constrained. So that the continued developmental goals are critical and the Caribbean community must stand for something with respect to the pursuit of these goals and with respect to the pursuit of the values that have made us stand up as a beacon in the global community and to be able to speak truth to power when we need to speak truth to power. Now, we can't do that if our slip is showing. I say no more at this stage. Meanwhile, international pressure is mounting on the caretaker app new AFC government to concede defeat and accept the results of the March 2 elections as shown by the national recount. Norway, Guyana's major financial partner on climate change, on Thursday renewed calls for a fair and transparent conclusion of the ongoing electoral process here. Ambassador of the Kingdom of Norway, Nils Martin Ganeg, posted on Twitter that, quote, Norway joins the call for a fair and transparent conclusion of the Guyana elections, end quote. He added that the declaration of the results must be based on the national recount as witnessed by the three-member CARICOM scrutineer team. This statement is in accordance with similar sentiments expressed by Norway on March 7, calling for a credible and transparent process. The Norwegian ambassador supported statements made by the chairperson of CARICOM, Mia Motley, and ambassadors of the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, and the European Union in Guyana. The national vote recount shows that the, opposition's, the opposition People's Progressive Party won the March 2 general and regional elections by 15,416 votes. Meanwhile, the United States has once again joined with international electoral observers and CARICOM to call for the conclusion of the 115 days electoral process with the declaration of a winner using the recount results. Uh, Michael Koza, the Acting Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs of the U.S. State Department, last night tweeted, quote, Ghana's electoral electorate that should be spoke clearly and respected international observers, end quote. He shared a statement by Motley, who reiterated CARICOM's unshakable belief that the winner of the elections should be declared from the certified figures from the recount. The U.S. government has repeatedly called on the Ghana government to respect the will of the Guyanese voters. We tell you now that six supporters of the APNU AFC coalition were charged with breaching the COVID-19 restriction by staging a protest action against the Ghana Elections Commission last week in New Amsterdam, Barbies. They appeared before Magistrate Peter Hugh at the New Amsterdam Magistrates Court on Thursday. Those charged include the Director of Regional Health Services, Javon Stephen, former Member of Parliament, Barbara Pilgrim, Executive of the Regional Arm of the PNC, Kirk Fraser, along with Karen France, Pollyanne Schultz and Quasi Joseph. They were represented by Attorney at Law, James Bond, who said that the police falsified evidence against three of his clients. Stephen, however, made it clear that he was not at the protest, which took place at Princess Elizabeth Road in New Amsterdam. Bond also told the media that his client, Joseph, was not present at the event, and Pilgrim, who was accused of organizing the protest, also denied. The trio pleaded not guilty and were placed on $10,000 bail. I'm quite certain members of the media is fully aware that Kevin Steve was not part of the event. However, I am here for the local party. And it's a member you will stand for any time of day. So if I'm pleased to stand for 10 times, that will make 10 times. Ago. But I was here yesterday. I was here on the 18th. And my plea is not here. The protest was organized by the APN University. Of which I'm a proud member of. Yeah. Where I was, Mr. Tisa? I think that's for me to know where I was. Okay. So where I was is for me to know. No, no, no. So based on my assumption that uh, once something goes wrong in the answer with um, AP and UFC, automatically Javon's name is associated with. So I think the police made their assumption and I'm, I'm pleased to prove that their assumption was incorrect. Uh, the police would have trumped up these charges against these individuals and um, in effect, we put it blatantly. The police maliciously, maliciously, deliberately falsified evidence, statements to show that Mr. Stevens was present, Mr. Joseph was present. They were not present. 
And um, I think Miss Pilgrim also they said hosted the event. She was not the host of the event. So there we uh, the three of them pleaded not guilty, but the others plead guilty. Mr. Ms. Schultz, um, Nurse Karen and uh, Mr. Fraser, they pleaded uh, guilty because they were present at the time. So, but it's very, it's very shocking that the police force, again, would say that Mr. Stevens was there when he was not there. And you, members of the media, uh, covered the event so very clearly that himself and, not, and Mr. Joseph were not present. That's the only thing I have on me. I can it with the charges, so to speak. Schultz, Fraser, and Franz, who were present at the protest on the day in question, pleaded guilty to the offense and were fined $10,000. Over 100 coalition supporters took to the streets of New Amsterdam, Barbies on June 18 with placards as they protested the decision of GCOM to use the figures from the national recount to declare a winner of the March 2020 elections. President David Granger talked up his Decade of Development Plan, which includes increased training for members of the Ghana Defense Force over the next 10 years and challenged soldiers to remain patriotic. He was at the time virtually addressing new officers of the GDF who recently completed their standard officers course. Bibi Katoon tells us more. In his address to the newest and the youngest ranks of the military, the incumbent president and leader of the APNU on Wednesday continued to speak of plans he has for the next 10 years. For graduation and promotion as second lieutenants are proud personal rites of passage. They are auspicious events at the organizational and national levels also. By their occurrence during the Defense Forces 55th anniversary this year and the start of Guyana's decade of development. Despite results from the national recount showing that his party was defeated in the March 2nd elections, the president said training for the officers of the Ghana Defense Force will be intensified at all levels during the next 10 years. The commander-in-chief of the armed forces delivered his address virtually in accordance with established COVID-19 guidelines. Training will be intensified at all levels during the next 10 years. Your personal education and expertise are essential to improving your leadership and stewardship. All of you will be provided with opportunities to upgrade your qualifications and skills. Emphasis will be placed on improving expertise in the Technical Corps, Air Corps, Coast Guard, Engineer Corps, Intelligence Corps and Signal Corps, the deployment of paratroops and the employment of artillery. On Thursday, the President delivered a second address to the officers as they were issued with their instruments of appointment. In congratulating the soldiers on their accomplishments, Mr. Granger, a retired brigadier, challenged the soldiers to uphold their oath to support and defend the country against all enemies. Those were your words. I challenge you to uphold the force's five core values, duty, discipline, identity, integrity, and loyalty. I challenge you to uphold the school's motto, I serve Guyana. I require that your conduct must be in accordance with the school's six maxims loyalty, honesty, worth, courage, discipline, and steadfastness. In response to comments made by international partners on the ongoing electoral process, the president and by extension his party has repeatedly said Ghana is a sovereign state and must reject interference in its internal affairs. He told the soldiers that the Defense Force is charged with preserving, protecting, and safeguarding Ghana's patrimony, political independence, territorial integrity, and sovereignty. B.B. Katoon, Newsroom. Still ahead on the Newsroom, Ghana's COVID-19 cases continue to rise and a pensioner loses his house in an early morning fire. An 81-year-old man is now homeless after his lot 33, Barrack Street, Kingston, Georgetown, Wooden, and Concrete House went up in flames early on Thursday. B.B. Katoon reports. A fire of unknown origin got in a two-story house located at the corners of 4th and Barrack Streets, Kingston, Georgetown. Danny Ram Harcheran, who owns and resided at the house, said he works as a gardener and leaves home at about six hours every day. He will spend three hours at his job before returning home, but on Thursday morning, there was nothing to return to. I am a gardener. I work with CGS, so I, I just go to work at 6 o'clock and come home at the hour between 9.30, 10. So as soon as I reached here, you know, I saw every single thing. I was actually coming home from work, and then I saw the firemen and all these people here and so on. So really, I don't know really what happened, but I saw the place in fire. 
You didn't live on anything, clothing or anything? No, not to my knowledge. Go store for anything. The man lived at the location for some 22 years, and with his belongings accrued during that time, he estimates his losses to be just above $20 million. I would have lost about $20 million with everything, the building and everything. The house is located in close proximity to a business place. Fire tenders arrived at the scene and prevented the fire from spreading to nearby buildings. The pensioner said he will be moving in with one of his sons, who lives at Freedom Hope on the west coast of Demerara. BB Katun, Newsroom. And six new persons tested positive for COVID-19 in the past 24 hours, bringing the total number of confirmed cases in Guyana to 215. The Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Shamdio Posar, delivered Thursday's update. Of the 84 tests that were done, there are six new cases, bringing the total number of cases to 215. The number of COVID-19 deaths remain at 12. 108 persons have recovered. We have 95 active cases in institutional isolation, 16 in institutional quarantine, and one patient in the COVID-19 ICU. The total number of tests done is 2,355, with 2,140 persons being negative. Parents and guardians, we are aware of the approaching July-August holidays, the time for fun activity away from home. We, emphasize, we empathize with you because the pandemic has curtailed most of their outdoor activities, the most important being that they have been unable to attend school. The upcoming holidays will be challenging as you try to keep them engaged, but more importantly, safe. We therefore ask you to start thinking ahead of innovative activities that are just as fun, which can be conducted within the confines of your residences. Keeping your children safe is a priority, and we hope that you remain committed to this task. We also wish to remind you that our child health clinics and antenatal clinics continue to function as our children's vaccine and growth monitoring is an ongoing process. Our antenatal mothers still need to be seen and examined at clinics for us to ensure that the pregnancy period is safe and without complications. If complications arise, we would like to diagnose these in a timely manner so that management can be initiated early. We call on all parents of children that are due for their HPV vaccine, that's 9 to 16 years old, to seek this service at the nearest health center. The Ministry of Public Health remains committed to eliminating cervical cancer but can only do this with your cooperation. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sports.